When pH equals pKa, there's no net charge on a protein. And at this point, we call it the isoelectric point. It's when the protein has no charge and hence in isoelectric focusing, the protein doesn't move. What's up you guys? My name is Carter and I'm a PhD bioengineer and founder of Sygen.com. On this channel, you're gonna learn new biotechniques every single week, and this will make you a more well-rounded scientist. Eventually, I hope, You'll actually go to SciGen.com, which is a search engine for biology methods, and you'll take the free protocols you find there and apply them in lab. If you're ready to be a better scientist who's more well-rounded, please click the like button, subscribe so you don't miss any episodes, and then also ask all the questions you have down below in the comments. Thank you, let's get into isoelectric focusing. So what is isoelectric focusing? This is a method to separate proteins based on charge. And previously, I've taught you how to separate proteins based on size using SDS page. If you haven't seen that video, make sure you check it out. I've got a link in the description of this video. Now, let's learn the theory behind isoelectric focusing. The first thing to understand for isoelectric focusing is that proteins are made of many amino acids. And the amino acids that they're made of have different charges. So here on our list of amino acids, you can see there are some that have electrically charged side chains. There are some that are uncharged. There are special cases and there are hydrophobic side chains. And look at this note. The side chain charge is calculated at a pH of 7.4 for this table. So that implies that the charge on the side chain can actually change depending on the pH. So like I said, the charge changes depending on the pH. So when the pH equals the pKa, there's no net charge. This is called the isoelectric point. And let's look at what this actually means. So take cysteine, for example, which is shown in the example below. Cysteine has a pKa of 8.3. Now, by default, look, cysteine has a side chain, which is a thiol. And any pH that's less than 8.3, it still looks like a thiol. But as soon as you get pH above 8.3, the thiol deprotonates. So when pH equals pKa, there's actually an equilibrium between these two types of cysteines, the one that has the protonation and one that's deprotonated. And as the pH goes higher than the pKa of 8.3, more of this species, which is the deprotonated form, shows up in solution. And when the pH is less than the pKa, more of this species shows up in solution. So the equilibrium tilts in either direction when the pH changes. Now remember, in electrophoresis, there's a cathode and there's an anode, and positive ions called cations migrate towards the cathode, and negative ions called anions move towards the anode. If you don't understand this, definitely check out the description of this YouTube video and you'll see a link to our old electrophoresis video which describes the theory and the practice of electrophoresis. So when you take into account that electrophoresis allows proteins to migrate in either direction based on their charge and you take into account that the pH determines the charge of any of the amino acids and hence the charge of the entire protein, now you get an interesting technique, which is called isoelectric focusing. In isoelectric focusing, you put your protein of interest onto a gel that has a range of pHs going from low pH to high pH. So let's just take our example protein, which has a cysteine in it. Like I said, the pI of cysteine is 8.3. At this point, the cysteine will have an equilibrium between the protonated and the non-protonated tile. So it will be neutrally charged. Now, according to electrophoresis, because it's neutrally charged, it has no reason to go towards the cathode or the anode in an electric field. Now imagine we put 
the cysteine containing protein somewhere here in the low pH area. At low pH, the pH is less than the pKa, so the thiol is protonated, and that means it's positively charged, so it wants to migrate towards this negatively charged cathode. And that's exactly what happens in isoelectric focusing. A protein that is positively charged migrates towards the negative cathode. And similarly, let's say our thiol containing protein is put here in the gel where it's high pH. So the pH is above the pi, and now the thiol is deprotonated and has a negative charge. Because of that, it's now going to migrate in this direction towards the anode, which is positively charged. Does that make sense? So in isoelectric focusing, proteins migrate based on their charge until they have no charge, and they all end up at their isoelectric points. In this case, the isoelectric point is 8.3 because of the cysteine containing protein. Now remember, proteins have a whole bunch of different side chains because of all the amino acids they're made of. So it's pretty likely that if you have a mixture of proteins, each one will have a different PI. And that means you can actually put a mixture of proteins onto one isoelectric focusing gel and have a whole bunch of different bands corresponding to each protein and its unique isoelectric point. That's what we're going to cover in this tutorial. How do you actually go about doing isoelectric focusing using a step-by-step -step protocol from BIRAD that makes isoelectric focusing instrument and gels? You excited? All right, let's get into the actual application of isoelectric focusing. So today we're going to be using this protocol from BIRAD, which is the Ready Strip IPG Strip Instruction Manual. And you can see here that it actually has a ton of information for you. And it has three different methods of rehydrating and actually doing IEF. So I'm only going to cover one of those methods. Here's method three. Here is method two. I'm just going to cover method one. Feel free to look at the description of this video and go through the entire BIRAD protocol if you want to try one of the other methods of isoelectric focusing using the ready strips. So step one is to add our protein sample, which contains a mixture of proteins, into rehydration buffer. And you can see here, you need to use a suitable rehydration buffer depending on the sample that you have. They've got a great section within the protocol that has some recommended buffers. So take a look at that. Now, with this sample inside the rehydration buffer, we're then going to pipette it into these lanes within the rehydration tray. This is just so that we can later on dip our gel for the isoelectric focusing into this. Now, at this point, our well looks like this. It's got sample and rehydration buffer just at the bottom of the well. Nothing fancy so far. Now in step two, what we do is we take the IPG gel and overlay it on top of our protein sample. In order to do that, we need to make sure that all of our proteins have been loaded into that equilibration tray, like in the previous step. And then we just put this IPG strip, with the gel side down onto the sample. And here you can see, it's pretty simple to use a set of tweezers and just lay the gel down so that it covers the entire lane. At this point, the idea is to make sure that our gel is completely overlaying our sample and at no location inside the lane do we have any air bubbles because air bubbles will prevent the gel from absorbing the sample at that location. The IEF gel or the IPG strip also has a layer of plastic on the back. And you need to make sure that none of your sample gets on top of the plastic because our goal is to make sure that our sample gets absorbed by the IEF gel. And if it's on the plastic, then 
it won't really go through the plastic into the gel. So you're going to miss out on some of the sample actually getting absorbed into the gel. Make sure that when you put the IPG strip gel down, that you put it down in the proper orientation. There's a nice plus sign that you can line up within the rehydration tray, just to make sure that the pH is decreasing in the right direction and that you have the anode and the cathode properly set up for the future. Our next set of steps is to add some mineral oil on top of the IEF gel, just to make sure that we prevent any evaporation during the rehydration process. Just a little bit should be plenty. Make sure that the oil doesn't actually spill into the sample. That won't be that great. They also give you this nice alternative of just waiting maybe about an hour before adding that oil on top. That should help prevent mixing with the sample. And then after that, all you have to do is incubate overnight on the bench. In step four, we just have to prepare the focusing tray by moving the IEF gel into the focusing tray. So first, we take the tray and then we add some water to it along with some paper wicks just to make sure that it's properly hydrated and it'll conduct well. Then we move the IPG strip from the equilibration or rehydration tray over to the focusing tray. Once again, make sure that you position it properly so that the plus sign is at the right location. The other thing to keep in mind is that you should drain the oil and get rid of any of the unabsorbed protein because we want to make sure that our gel has all the protein inside and make sure that none of it is outside unabsorbed. This is the end goal. So what we really want are crisp bands when we finally do the analysis of our gel. But if we have unabsorbed protein on the outside, this causes horizontal streaking and our protein bands look hazy. So make sure that the IPG strips are clear of any mineral oil and unabsorbed protein on the surface. Finally, make sure there are any air bubbles. Once again, that's going to prevent the IPG strip from working as intended. Here you can see what it's like to place the IPG strip gel side down into the focusing tray. Very simple, just like before using forceps. Finally, we take that IEF gel, which has already been in the focusing tray, and then put it into the instrument. In Byrad's case, it's called the protein IEF cell. We click the start button and look here. They tell you to maintain a certain temperature. There are actually different types of strips, some of different lengths, and that will help you resolve your proteins better. So if you have two proteins that are really close together, having a longer IPG strip will help you resolve them better because they can travel a larger distance on the strip. And at the end, this is the kind of data that we expect. We expect that all of our proteins have separated according to their individual PIs. But of course, we can't see them yet because we haven't stained yet. So that's coming up in the next step. Your final step is to do the analysis after you stain your gel. Kamasi Blue is a classic way of staining proteins in gels. I'm not gonna really cover the protocol for Kamasi Blue here, but this is the kind of data that you expect. You can see here, what happens when you have nice bands that are clearly focused. And you can see here what happens when you have bad looking bands that are too diffuse to really analyze properly. All your proteins have been separated according to their pHs. Another cool thing you can do with isoelectric focusing is to do SDS page after isoelectric focusing. This is called 2D gel electrophoresis. What happens here is first you run isoelectric focusing so that you can separate proteins based on their charge and then you run STS page so that you can separate proteins based on their size. So you can see here you can actually add a really complex mixture of proteins inside your IPG strips, separate them on charge first and then run STS page and separate them based on size so that you can get a full profile of all the proteins that you have in solution. Of course, this kind of data is very complex to analyze and you need proper software to do it. All right, guys, I hope you found that tutorial on isoelectric focusing really, really interesting and useful. Isoelectric focusing is a method of separating proteins based on their PI. In our case, we went through an example where we had a protein that was made primarily of cysteines and we showed how the protein migrates depending on 
its pH and its pi. I hope now you've learned the technique and you're ready to go to Saijin.com and find protocols that you can apply to your proteins of interest. Make sure you also ask any questions below in the comments. You click the like buttons because I hope you like this tutorial. And you click subscribe so that you can learn a new technique every single week by following my channel. Thank you very much. Happy sciencing.